Obviously, the biggest news of the past week was David K., George Bush's almost personal weapons inspector, having returned from Iraq, testified before the Senate, gave numerous interviews, and then all of them said, hey, you know something? There aren't any weapons of mass destruction over there, and there weren't even any at the time that our government was telling us that there were. And, gosh, I don't know how we could have been so wrong, but we were all fooled by this. Of course, no one mentions that a lot of people, such as Scott Ritter and other of the prior inspectors, people like Hans Blix, said there was no evidence of weapons over there. But, of course, we were all fooled. Those people who said before the war that there were probably no weapons there, well, they didn't really know that. They were just trying to be contrary, I guess. Well, of course, the important point is George Bush didn't know there were, but he spoke as though he did. And there's, of course, a great deal of finger pointing going on around now. John Kerry, who is one of God's practical jokes, I think, says that Bush should fire George Tennant, the CIA director. If I were president of the United States, I think I would fire George Tennant, but not for failing to give proper intelligence information, but rather for failing to stand up on his hind legs and defy the president who seemed to be determined to peddle the story that there were weapons of mass destruction there. One of the interesting things about the K testimony was that when he was asked whether George Bush should apologize to the American people, he said it wasn't George Bush's fault, it was bad intelligence. And here is a direct quote from David K. Quote, I think if anyone was abused by the intelligence, it was the President of the United States, rather than the other way around, end of quote. Can you imagine? Poor little Georgie Bush was abused by somebody who fed him bad intelligence. I think that somebody ought to tell Mr. K what W.C. Fields said, and that is, you cannot cheat an honest man. Remember, this is the George Bush who said he doesn't need to read newspapers or watch TV news where he might see dissenting views because everything he needs to know he gets from Condoleezza Rice, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld, so he doesn't need no stinking contrary opinion. This is the man whose Secret Service keeps all protesters out of sight at presidential parades, cavalcades, and rallies, while lining up enthusiastic supporters to display pro-Bush and pro-war signs to cheer the president along the way. This is the man who came into the White House telling his aides that he had only one preconceived policy, and that was to get rid of Saddam Hussein. This is the man who didn't bother to ask for hard evidence before telling us over and over again that he was absolutely certain that Hussein had chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons of mass destruction. Not weapons programs, not blueprints, not bad intentions, not bad breath, but that he actually had these weapons. And a little while ago, I wrote an article, Lying for a Living was the name of it. You can see it right on the homepage of my website, harrybrown.org. There's a link to it there, in which I cite a half a dozen times when George Bush made categorical statements. And if you think I just made up these statements, each one of them has a link to the original. And the original is not some news report of it. It is the White House's own web page showing the text of the Bush speeches in which he made these statements. But this is the man who thinks that his knowledge is so complete and infallible that we can just do away with the Bill of Rights, do away with fair trials, do away with the rules of evidence, and detain people indefinitely as long as George Bush happens to know that this is, as he put it, a bad guy. That's the way he referred to Jose Padilla. We didn't have to worry about lawyers and trials and making charges and so on because he's one of the bad guys, George Bush told us. This is the man who had his aides tell congressmen that Iraq had the ability to drop nuclear bombs on the east coast of the United States through those fabled unmanned vehicles which turned out to be nothing more than high school gliders put together with balsa wood and paper. This is a man who wanted so much to believe that the weapons of mass destruction had been found that he reacted to the report of the discovery of two mobile trailers by telling the world, see, 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 we found the weapons of mass destruction, only to have to be contradicted a day later by his own people saying, well, you know, actually these things were used to make hydrogen for weather balloons. This is the man, and we're supposed to believe that this innocent little man was abused. You know, the interesting thing is that even now, he is not in the slightest way repentant about any of this. He says the world is a better place with Hussein gone, even though there are numerous governments in power today that are far more oppressive than Hussein's was. China, for example. Russia, for example. Turkmenistan, for example. Uzbekistan, for example. Pakistan, for example. And far from apologizing for the deaths that his mistakes have caused, he implies that the thousands of deaths, American and Iraqi, were worthwhile because the surviving Iraqis are free today. We liberated the country. But, of course, he has no knowledge of what freedom in Iraq means today, 
where you go through checkpoints and carry ID cards and face roadblocks, and if you're not careful, you get shot. When some American soldier fires because he's trigger happy, afraid that that suspicious looking person across the street is suddenly going to whip out a gun and fire at him, and the next thing you know, you or members of your family are dead. That's what George Bush calls freedom. And that's kind of scary, isn't it? Because he says America is a free country. Well, for almost 60 years, American presidents have been pushing the world around. Up to now, they've been doing it pretty much in secret. And as a result, very few Americans were aware that U.S. money, U.S. forces, U.S. weapons were used to overthrow governments in various parts of the world or to aid dictators to keep their governments and oppress their people in places like Iran, Indonesia, Guatemala, Vietnam. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. El Salvador, many, many other countries. Unfortunately, however, the people in those countries were well aware of the U.S. role, and they hate us for it. And so when George Bush says al-Qaeda has cells and connections and affiliated networks all over the world, he may well be right. I don't know that he is. I don't believe anything that he says just on the basis of his saying it. But he may well be right because America has sowed hatred for America all around the world. And when I say America has done that, of course I mean the American government, not you and me. I doubt that one American in ten is even aware that American airplanes were bombing Iraq continually through the 1990s. America subverted foreign governments using money, the CIA, special forces, and occasionally overt military power, as in Panama and Grenada and Haiti. But mostly it was done on the QT. But we don't have that anymore. Now we have the Bush Doctrine, and no longer do American agents act in secret. It's all out in the open, and in effect, this is what the Bush Doctrine says. I am the king of the world. What I say goes, I decide which governments remain and which must be overthrown. Even the most oppressive governments may be able to remain if they pledge their allegiance to me. I decide who can have nuclear weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and who cannot. I decide who will live and who will die. That is the Bush Doctrine, and that is what we live with, and that is how we are supposed to end all of the hatred of America that came about because of American military pushing the rest of the world around. Somehow, I don't think it's going to work. Somehow, I think there must be a better way. And if you have any ideas on that subject, or any other subject, give me a call. Let's see what Don in California has to say. Good evening, Don. Uh, good evening. What's up? Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple things about something I don't think anybody said anything about, but it's about the Mars program and space stations that they're uh -huh. think, uh, thinking about setting up there. And what really scares me is any time we go out into space, first thing we do is put weapons out there. <laughs> of course, of course. Why not? I mean... Right. And it just scares me to death that we're going to go to Mars and put our weapons out there and that we're really going to be held accountable if we start blowing up space, not just this planet. Well, at least there aren't people in other countries that will then want to bomb the World Trade Center. I mean, people in, on other planets who are going to come and bomb the World Trade Center. But I understand what you're saying. It just seems that government cannot get away from the military. But it does call attention to the fact that government is force, and the only reason you ever turn anything over to the government is to force somebody to do something or to pay for something or to stop doing something contrary to the wishes of that individual. And so it sort of figures that anywhere the government goes, guns follow it and weapons follow it because that's how you enforce government edicts, and every government law is backed up by fines and imprisonment or it would be of no value to the government whatsoever. But you're making a very interesting point. And, of course, this whole Mars thing is just absolutely ridiculous. It's just one more huge, huge boondoggle with a little science fiction uh, razzle-dazzle to go along with it, but the fact of the matter is that there is no earthly reason to be sending a, a probe to Mars, certainly not by our government. If there were some good reason for it, some company in America would be doing it in order to make a buck off of it, and if you can't make a buck off, off of it, it means that there is no value in it to any human being because no human being is going to pay you for it. Uh, I'm sorry, Don, I didn't mean to go on. This is your nickel. Hey, that sounded pretty good to me. <laughs> I, I just think we need to find some kind of radical way to get peace in this world, and military ways just ain't going to do it. Well, you'd think, that with, you'd think with $2 trillion at their disposal, uh, the people in our government could hire the best minds to come up with something better than the caveman tactics we've been seeing. Yeah, yeah, and it's just something we've got to stop, and we can't go wasting a whole lot of time before we really do something about it, or we're just going to be a little bit too late. You're so right. Thanks so much for calling, Don. Hey, right, thanks for listening to me. Stay in touch with us. Let's talk now with Mark in New Orleans. Good evening, Mark. Yes, good evening. They know there are two of us. Yes, I know, and this is the other Mark. This is the other one. <laughs> First, I want to say, uh, when you're traveling, make sure you don't carry any almanacs or uh, atlases with you. Oh, uh, is that a tip-off that I'm a terrorist? Oh, yeah, we didn't hear about that. It came out right, right before New Year's. They said that uh, people who carry almanacs with them when they travel are most likely <laughs> terrorists. FBI uh, released all local law enforcement. So well, that no, Frank, no, Ben Franklin must be a terrorist, huh? Nobody has, nobody has a legitimate reason to carry an almanac oh, with no. them. Oh, no. Not even Ben Franklin, who wrote one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, I, I'm surprised you didn't hear about that. Oh, a lot of things get by me, Mark. <laughs> but that was one of the most ridiculous things that the, uh, that the Federal Bureau of Thugs came out with. Idiots. Federal Bureau of Idiots. Mm. Uh, okay, um, next month, February, is going to be the 106th anniversary of 
the blowing up of the main. Oh, my goodness. Let's have a party. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, now I'll tell you, there's a lot of parallels here. We were lied to about that. Yes. And, uh... It is, of course, almost every war has started with one, at least one gigantic lie, and then, of course, a whole number of lies associated with it. But the, the story of the Maine is pretty interesting because it carried all the way through the war, even though a few people were suspicious about the idea. What happened was the United States was sitting and watching the Cuban Revolution. The Cubans were trying to break free from Spain, and suddenly in the middle of it, William McKinley ordered the battleship Maine to sail into Havana Harbor to try to intimidate the Spanish there and help out the Cubans. And after the Maine had been sitting there for a few days, suddenly it blew up, and the immediate idea promoted by William Randolph Hearst in his newspapers and a lot of politicians was that the Spaniards had done it and that was the immediate provocation for going to war with Spain. After the Maine exploded, everybody in America just took the assumption that the Spaniards had done it because they didn't want the U.S. In, to have a battleship in Havana Harbor, and so the U.S. Gov Congress declared war. We went to war. The war was over fairly quickly in Cuba, and of course the United States had no colonial designs on anybody whatsoever, but once they got their hands on Guam and the Philippines and so on, they thought, well, maybe the U.S. ought to keep these, and the U.S. had helped the Philippines to break free from Spain in the course of the Spanish-American War, but when the war was over, it turned out that McKinley wasn't going to let the Philippines be independent. They were going to become a colony of the United States, and the Philippine rebels who had fought the Spaniards didn't like that very much, so for two years afterward, there was a horrendous war in the Philippines in which the Philippine insurrection was finally subdued, and it was very much like what's going on in Iraq today in that it was our military fighting guerrilla forces, and a lot of Americans got killed and thousands and thousands of Philippines got killed. And then, of course, uh, after the war was over, people began to wonder whether the Maine really was blown up by the Spaniards. And finally, I believe it was about 20 years ago, Admiral Hyman Rickover uh, headed up a commission appointed by somebody in our government to determine what happened to the Maine. And he investigated everything that was available about it and came to the conclusion that it was, I believe, a boiler that exploded in the interior of the battleship and that there was no torpedo, there was no bomb, there was no anything else. It was purely what we think of as an accident. So here we are, situation where everybody went to war and it turned out that the reason for going to war didn't actually exist. And if that sounds familiar, it ought to because that's what we've been seeing the last year. Mark, did I leave anything out there? No, no, it was just that they blamed it on, on a mine in the harbor. On a mine, mine in the harbor, right. okay. They blamed that the harbor was mined, but later they couldn't find any evidence on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. isn't it convenient? Yes, of course. And, of course, the, the interesting thing about this is that when the war is over, people go back to their lives and they are glad the war is over, and they really don't want to think about what was said before the war. That was the case. They tried to have investigations after World War II into Pearl Harbor, and they couldn't drum up any real public interest in them, even though the investigations demonstrated that Roosevelt knew in advance that the Japanese were going to do something dire and they were going to do it in December of, of 1941. And now, by later evidence that's come out in just the last two or three years, it seems apparent that they actually knew that it was Pearl Harbor. But nobody is interested. It's all ancient history. And it was ancient history after the Spanish-American War. And today, I think the vast majority of Americans are not really concerned whether there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq because they're just glad it's over or seems to be over. And there's just so many parallels between the Spanish-American War and, well, just everything that's happened in the 20th century. Yeah, between not all just, of... Not just the recent thing, but you know, World War One, World War II, Absolutely, Korea, all the wars. Vietnam, everything. It's, they all parallel each other, including Spanish American War, and possibly uh, Mexican American War uh, 50 years earlier, too. Well, as Randolph Bourne said during the First World War, war is the health of the state, and politicians see a tremendous advantage. You know, for years and years, the Marxists and the socialists uh, used to talk about the merchants of death, the munitions manufacturers, whom they felt were secretly pulling the strings behind the, the curtain and causing all the wars so that they could get filthy rich. Well, there probably is a certain amount of that because everybody wants to get his hand in the till. The farmers, the teachers, everybody else is always lobbying the government to do something favorable to his industry. But it, it doesn't really re require that because politicians have such an, a vested interest in going to war. There are so many good things that happen to politicians, and George Bush is a perfect example. Here's a guy that in 2001 had a mediocre approval rating. He had won the presidency in what was really a fluke. He didn't have the majority of the popular vote, but he won the electoral vote. And he, But even winning the electoral vote was in question because it just depended on who made the decisions. One, if one group decided in Florida, then it was Gore. If one group decided in Washington, then it was Bush. And the ones in Washington had the final approval, so Bush was in. He looked very much like his father, a one-term president, and suddenly along comes 9-11, and Bush is the leader of the free world, and he's riding high, and he's got an approval rating of 80%, and there just is no stopping him from then on. And, of course, the Iraq war just continued in that tradition. And now the question is, is he going to start another war before Election Day? I kind of doubt it myself. So you don't think he'll wave the dog on this one? No, I don't think he can because of the flack that's come out about the weapons of mass right. destruction and so on. I think it would be very, very difficult for him to pull it off again. And so his re-election is now in more doubt than it might have seemed to be six months ago. Right. Okay, well, it was just the uh, you know, Spanish-American War was one of the first that we, 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 meaning the federal government, started sticking its nose where it didn't belong, and 
it came back to haunt. <laughs> yes, how true. Right. All right, thanks so much for calling, Thank Mike. You. Let's now go to Arkansas and talk with Mike. Good evening, Mike. Uh, you know, I listened to about a two-minute monologue of uh, you bashing, you know, President Bush. Not bashing him, but just questioning him. And I know that you had uh, presidential aspirations at one time. What would you do if you had been in his shoes at this time? Well, that's a big question. And, and I, I know that's a big question. Well, well I know, but before but, you hang up, I want to make sure that I answer it properly. So I want to make sure exactly what you're referring to. Do you mean what would I have done about 9-11? Do you, what would I do about Iraq? What would I do now about Iraq after the war is over? What, what specifically are you referring to? Well, what if you had been elected instead of uh, George Bush? All right. From his point on, I know, and I do agree uh, with your libertarian uh, thoughts, you know, I mean, I wish we could all get along and have the Rodney King, you know, theory <laughs> that we could all get along, and, and but it's just, life is just not that way, no, and I, I would doesn't. just like to know what you would do if you were, you know, sitting in the White House today, uh, because I believe strongly in my president, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, a Republican, and, and I'm not, I'm not backing Bush just because I'm a Republican, but I don't see anybody else out there that's going to do a better job, but... Uh, some of the accusations and everything that, that a lot of people are making, especially the Democrats, you know, that run, are, uh, you know, false. Well, I think the criticisms by the Democrats that just have to be chalked up to election year rhetoric. And we know that if they were in office, they would probably wind up doing the same thing. We have to remember that when George Bush was running for president, he was very emphatic in one of the debates that he thought that Clinton's aggressive foreign policy was causing a great deal of harm in the world. And he said he wanted a much more humble foreign policy because he didn't believe in nation building. He didn't believe that we should go into other countries and try to turn them around and make them more like us. And of course, he has done everything exactly the opposite of what he was saying in that debate. And I would expect the same thing from Howard Dean or John Kerry or any of the others. They are bashing Bush because they want to be president. Right. So we don't need, really need to pay a great deal of attention to that. You can pay attention to me, however, because I haven't got a chance in the world of becoming president. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the question I'm, I, that I'm asking you. Well, I will be glad to answer it, and you're welcome because to stay on the only The only reason I'm asking the question is because of your monologue, which was sure. more or less Bush bashing and that we shouldn't be there. And I have a son that's in Iraq right now, and that kind of ticks me off. Well, I can understand that. I do not in any way want to make you think that I am speaking out against your son. I feel very, very sorry for the fact that your son is over there and might suffer harm by being there, and I feel very, very badly about what you have to go through, wondering what in the world is happening over there, and it really ticks me off to think that he has to be there when he is not serving any purpose for America. I believe he is serving a purpose for George Bush, and I really am very, very angry about the fact that with all of this coming out about the weapons of mass destruction, that George Bush offers no apology whatsoever to the families of people who have had sons and daughters killed over there for what turned out to be absolutely untrue. And you can say he got bad intelligence, but he's the president of the United States. He should have demanded hard evidence before he sent people off to die. And if he can't do that, then what is he doing being president of the United States? If the buck stops there, then let's see him take some responsibility for something. I haven't heard him take responsibility for one thing that has gone wrong in all of this. It's always somebody else's fault. Now, let me answer your question, and you're welcome to stay on the line if you want and comment on my answer. First of all, upon being elected president of the United States, wow, and taking office in January of 2001, I would have ordered the troops home. I would have closed the 702 American bases that exist in foreign countries around the world. 702 American bases in foreign countries. I would have closed all of them. I would have stopped immediately and completely the practice of using American forces or American agents to overthrow or to shore up foreign governments. I would have put an immediate end to foreign aid so that there is no money being extracted by force from American taxpayers and sent to foreign governments to prop up those governments. I would have made it clear that America is now going to follow the foreign policy of Washington and Jefferson and keep its nose out of other people's affairs. I believe, and there is no way I can prove it, but I believe that we would have uh, about a 75 to 90 percent probability that there would have been no 9-11 attack once it was clear that the United States was no longer going to support Israel, no longer bully other countries, no longer try to decide what governments were legitimate and what were illegitimate, and as a result, there probably would have been no 9-11. Had there been a 9-11 anyway, I would have ordered that American agents try to find out exactly what happened, try to make arrangements to capture and bring to the United States through legal extradition methods, the people who might have been responsible for it who weren't killed in it. Those people should have been tried, all the evidence put forward, and those people, if convicted, should have suffered for it. And if you say that, well, that doesn't seem very likely to me that that would succeed, that you would be able through legal channels to get these people back, well, you may be right, but they haven't been captured through any other way. Thousands and thousands of people have been killed in the last two years. 
And we still don't have Osama bin Laden. We still don't have anybody else who seems to have actually been connected with it. They have captured only one person that they claim had some connection with it, but that seems to be very, very dubious. So please don't judge my proposals against the standard of instant perfection, that my proposals are unworkable unless they result in immediate world peace and gratification, because what we're getting now doesn't get that. And I can tell you that one of the things I would not have done as president is to issue any order that would put in jeopardy the lives of anyone, American or foreign, who did not have anything to do with the 9-11 attacks. I would not have American soldiers in Afghanistan killing people and being killed, and I certainly would not have them in Iraq killing and being killed. Yes, Saddam Hussein was a dictator. How bad of a dictator, I don't know, because all I hear is George Bush and his mantra about the rape rooms, the mass graves, and so on, but I haven't seen any hard evidence of any of that. The man was obviously a dictator. The man is a politician. That's enough to give him two strikes uh, in my book. So I'm not here to defend Saddam Hussein. All I'm trying to tell you is that it is none of our business. If you, as an individual, want to contribute money or contribute your life to go over there and try to overthrow a dictator in Iraq or Iran or Syria or Pakistan or Uzbekistan, then you should be free to do so, even though it's illegal in the United States today for you to do that, as John Walker found out. You should be free to do that, but you should not have the authority to order me to do that or to order me to pay for it. It is not our government's business to be overthrowing foreign dictators, foreign democratic governments, which our government has done in the past. It is none of our government's business to be involved in any of that. And holding up this specter of a mushroom cloud and all of this other stuff that George Bush did is merely trying to incite a lynch mob to go out and do things that are not only illegal, but that they are not only immoral, but very, very, very dangerous to the people of the United States, not just the soldiers that go over there, but the people of the United States here at home, because there is no question in my mind that the Iraqi war has boosted the recruiting methods of al-Qaeda or whoever is out there and wants to do harm to the United States. It is just proof positive that what they've been saying about the United States, being a bully trying to run the world, is correct. Well, I told you what I would have done if I were president of the United States. I would appreciate your thoughts on it. What would you have done? Is there something I'm missing here? One last thought, and I find myself mentioning this almost every week on this show. Our government has $2 trillion a year of our money. I am just an individual. You may not believe this, but I don't make $2 trillion a year. I, I don't even make a trillion. I don't even make a billion. Well, I don't even make a million. But at least I've got some ideas about this. But with $2 trillion a year, if they just spent what they spent on that stupid Mars lander, Looking for people who have better ideas, they could have come up with far better solutions than they have, and probably even better solutions than I've come up with. But no, all they know how to do is to run around the world beating people up and trying to throw their weight around. Jonathan, who calls in from time to time from Washington, D.C., sent an interesting quote. Uh, Josh Bolton, the White House budget director, was asked by the New York Times or some reporter, had President Bush violated the spirit of his 2000 campaign by dramatically expanding the federal budget? And this is what Bolton said to defend the president. Quote, the president campaigned as a conservative who favors limited government, but activism in those areas where government is going to spend money and has responsibilities. I think he has followed through on the philosophy on which he campaigned. End of quote. Oh, the indignities one has to suffer these days to be a Republican. That's really something. We have a president who is in favor of limited government, but wherever government is going to spend money, then it should be very activist. Now, tell me an area where the government is not spending money these days. It's spending money on education, on health care, on charity, on sending a lunar lander or whatever it is to Mars. It is <laughs> The President of the United States is lecturing all the sports people about getting rid of steroids. There was something, oh, what was it that followed in the, oh, Oh, yes, uh, the federal government is now going to have a program to assist parents in helping their children to avoid unwanted pregnancies. That was another little tidbit that the president had in his State of the Union message and so on. So, in other words, the president favors limited government. Limited to what? Limited to everything. Oh, my. All right. Pete in Knoxville, Tennessee, says, do you have any idea now how well the Libertarian Party might do in the 2004 presidential election? No, I don't, and I don't know exactly what to say. There is no presidential candidate so far who has as activist a campaign at this point in the end of January of election year as I had in 2000. However, Gary Nolan is doing, the, I think, the best he can with very limited resources. At this point in 2000, we had raised, and I don't have the figures anywhere near to take a look and give you a precise number, but I would say we must have raised at least a half a million dollars by that time, and I think Gary has raised less than 100000 The other candidates, I don't believe, have raised any 
appreciable amount at all, at the most maybe $10,000 or something. And I just don't see a full-fledged campaign that's going to have very much media coverage. Not that we had an overwhelming amount in 96 or 2000. But we need to understand that the reason for the presidential campaign is to acquaint people who are not familiar with the libertarian philosophy that there's a better way than what we're getting now. It is not to get as many votes as possible because you're not going to get very many votes. Another similar question from Bill in Hot Springs. Do you have any thoughts about Aaron Russo as an LP presidential candidate? Well, if you didn't know, Aaron Russo threw his hat in the ring a month or two ago, which is kind of late in the game to be doing this. But Aaron Russo is a Hollywood producer who has been somewhat of a libertarian for many years, and he was a very successful producer. I really don't know how rich he is, but he ran for governor in Nevada in 2002, I believe it was, and uh, or maybe in 2000, and got a pretty respectable coverage and pretty respectable vote. He's a very aggressive kind of harsh speaking individual, runs a very blunt campaign, I would say, and I don't know how well he might do, and I, I really don't want to offer an opinion on it. Bill also asked, do you have any thoughts about the vice presidential slot? No, I don't have any, and I don't believe I've heard of anybody who's seeking that. Bill also says, by the way, continue thanks to you for doing your radio show. I know it's reaching at least some non-LP members here in Hot Springs. And thanks for coming to Hot Springs at the NRA rally in August 2000. You reached many non-libertarians there. The only reason I pass that on to you, the listener, right now, is that that rally in Arkansas was an example of what an LP candidate can do, even though he has no chance of being elected and no chance of getting what we would consider a respectable vote. The NRA rally that he talked about had several congressional candidates who were Republicans and even one Democratic congressional candidate. It was moderated by the governor of Arkansas, a man named Huckabee at the time, or at least he gave an opening speech, and the president of the NRA was there. I don't know why. I can never remember his name. It'll probably come to me in a minute. And they invited me, a libertarian. And while they kept saying that all these Republicans kept saying that gun laws are unconstitutional, that gun laws breed crime, that gun laws are bad and everything, and we shouldn't have any new gun laws, we should enforce the laws that are on the books, which doesn't make any logical sense at all if gun laws are unconstitutional and bad. I was the only one there who said, if it's all so bad, and I agree with you that it's bad, then the answer, obviously, is to repeal all the gun laws on the books and, and not be talking about enforcing the ones that are on the books. And that got a tremendous response there, a really, really strong response. And just that one statement acquainted people with kind of the the vacuousness of the, sl the sloganeering Republican approach to things like gun rights. So it helps to have our candidate out talking to people wherever possible, especially on radio and TV. A fellow named Banner in Maryland says, I'd like to have your opinion on the computer or touchscreen voting machines that have no paper trail to be audited. I don't trust these machines. Well, you're probably right not to trust them, but I'm afraid I don't know anything about them. All right, Chris says, now they admit that there are no weapons, so now I'm hearing a few mumbles that they might have been moved to Syria. How convenient, the next place that we're supposed to attack in the war on terror. After that, maybe we'll be going to Somalia, then Rwanda, then to some other country that most people can't even find on a map because map makers haven't drawn it in this year's World Atlas. And, of course, they don't want to be fooling around with a World Atlas, Chris, because they might be targeted as terrorists. Wasn't it almanacs and atlases that are suspicious? Chris goes on to say, as for Hussein, when you think about it, he lied to his people like George Bush. Hussein is a warmonger like George Bush and gave pompous speeches like George Bush's State of the Reich speech last week. I think they should make Hussein president of the Republican National Committee. He's perfect for the job, and he doesn't want to go back to Iraq anyway. Since we've paid off and kept many dictators in power, why not one more? Well, Chris, I'm sure you know we already did our bit with Saddam Hussein back in the 80s, sending him lots of weapons and other things so that he could become a real first-class dictator that we could go to war with someday. And Chris also says, on a side note, a couple of friends of mine who are Persian were telling me how the people of Iran don't like the government there, and we came up with an interesting idea. Imagine if the peoples of Iran took up arms and overthrew the theocracy there and established the United States of Persia based on liberty, common sense, and free trade. I don't know why, but I think George Bush and his big empire cronies would have a fit. They probably would. George Bush Sr. helped the Iraqis put down the rebellion that occurred against Hussein immediately after the Gulf War. And, of course, uh, when the Soviet Union was breaking up in 1990 or 1991, George Bush Sr. made it very clear that our government didn't think it was a good idea for the Soviet Union to break up. Isn't it a shame that he didn't get reelected? And an email from an unsigned person out in cyberspace. He refers to an article by Clifford D. May in which he May says that because the ACLU has not reported any abuse, therefore the Patriot Act is not as odious as the New York Times and other people are stating. Well, that's just simply not true. The ACLU has complained about uh, the Padilla case, about a lot of other things. And if the Patriot Act were not giving the government new powers to restrain people and to create havoc, then why would they bother passing in the first place? It's interesting that the, uh, I haven't read this article, incidentally, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but it's interesting that it's by Clifford May. I know Clifford May. I've met him two or three times, and he was very, very encouraging in 2000 to my campaign, 
he was in Denver, and he took me to lunch, and he wanted to do anything he could to help the Libertarian presidential campaign. After Bush was elected, lo and behold, Clifford D. May got himself a position in the Bush administration. Now he shows up on television and screams insults at anybody who dares think that George Bush is anything but the greatest president this country has ever had. And it just shows you, once again, how insidious the party system is. Once you sign on to a party, you sign off on whatever principles you had because you become convinced that the survival of that party and the victory of that party is necessary, and you have to make sacrifices, and the first thing to sacrifice, of course, is your principles. Let's talk now with Rob in Pittsburgh. Good evening, Rob. Hey, Harry Brown. Um, are you familiar with a fellow in Pennsylvania named uh, Henry Holler? Or I, Haller? I don't believe so. Okay, well, um, you know, last year, the first time I called your show, your guest was Ken Krawchuk. Mm -hmm. And I had called, and uh, I was so busy telling you that I had voted for you the two times he ran for president, I forgot to tell Ken that I had voted for him when he ran for governor of Pennsylvania. And when I started going to meetings at the local Libertarian Party, I met his running mate from that election, and, and that was this Henry Haller, uh, or Haller, however it's pronounced, sorry. But um, at the last Libertarian meeting, he lent me a disc that I can use on my computer to listen to MP3s, and it's speeches from the Freedom Summit. Uh, oh, in, in uh, Phoenix? Um I think the, 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 one, one, the one just a few months ago in Arizona. Yeah, uh, you know, so I've been listening to that. It has you and a bunch of other people on there, and uh, it's really interesting. And it's, it's kind of discouraging, though. There's a lot of, um, it seems like a lot of people are saying, well, trying to have a political party and, and trying to do things that way isn't working very well. Um, and I'm, I, I'm getting discouraged myself, um, though I, I'll probably end up voting for Gary Nolan in November. I, I suspect he'll be the person on the ticket. And, um, you know, I mean, it might be tempting to vote for one of these Democrats to try to oust George Bush. Uh, and I could even see it being tempting to vote for Bush to try to block one of these Democrats, but I, you know, I'm not going to fall for that kind of thinking anymore. You know what I mean? Good. <laughs> but um, the, but you know, I, I, I would like the Libertarian Party to keep on doing what it's doing as best as it can because, um, you know, it's like you've talked about. Was it worth running for president? Um, I mean, I'm just one person. I'm only one measly little citizen with one puny little vote. But I mean, your campaigns changed my life. You know, I mean, if I hadn't seen you on C-SPAN in 1996, and and that sort of thing. You know, I don't know what would have happened as far as my political thinking would have gone. You know. Sure, I, I understand. And we need to understand that the Libertarian Party is just one aspect of the Libertarian movement. And right. it's not fair to judge the Libertarian Party on the basis of how the whole Libertarian movement has succeeded or failed over X period of time. We need to do many things. The Libertarian Party needs to be there to provide candidates, to take advantage of the platforms that exist when somebody runs for office. Uh, but there needs to be a lot more. The American Liberty Foundation is trying to get ads on radio and television to try to reach people who have never thought about these things before and to catch some new prospects. Uh, the Cato Institute is providing research information so that people like you or I uh, can have facts and figures at our disposal that we might not otherwise have. And there are all sorts of other organizations who are, to a certain extent, trying to hold the line, like the Institute for Justice and some of these others who are fighting very, very tyrannical or unfair things that go on at the local, state, or federal level. And it's going to take an awful lot to happen. And to say that, well, the LP hasn't succeeded because it hasn't elected a president or even a congressman yet, that's just not looking at the situation realistically. So I hope that you will continue to do what you feel comfortable doing if you try to do something that you don't feel comfortable with, you're not going to do it well, and you're not going to do it for very long. It's going to become too much of a burden, and you're just simply going to give up and, and fade away. But if you look at the various alternative ways there are to try to help and do it in a way that doesn't bend your own life out of shape, then you not only can contribute something to this movement, but you can also enjoy yourself while you're doing it. I certainly have a good time. I mean, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't be happier than spending these two hours with you and other folks on this network every Saturday night, and I do bend myself out of shape every once in a while writing an article when I'm not as inspired as I would like to be, but most of the time I'm doing what I want to do. And because I'm doing what I want to do, I think I'm doing a better job than I would do if I were spending my time doing a lot of things that I don't want to do and I'm not really sure are going to succeed. Well, let's check in now with Chuck in California. Good evening, Chuck, and my apologies for keeping you waiting so long. Hello. Yes. All right. I got a message for Rob in Pittsburgh. All right. Convert as many as you can to libertarianism. Augment, increase the commitment to libertarianism among those libertarians that he knows and vote a straight libertarian ticket. Well, I can't argue with that advice. Okay, but the reason I called tonight, and I thought since someone asked you earlier what you would do if you were president, mm -hmm. I want to put you in another position. I want to put you as a historian in Japan and Germany after the Second World War. If they had prevailed, what would their history book say was the cause of the war? Well, in Japan, I'm sure they would say that the browbeating by Roosevelt of the Japanese war cabinet during 1940 and 1941 prompted 
the Japanese high command to realize that war was inevitable, and so Japan, in a brilliant stroke, attacked Pearl Harbor to try to cripple the American fleet and give Japan time to figure out how they were going to succeed against a much stronger enemy. And they also, of course, would talk about the war crimes trials in which they put people like uh, Curtis LeMay and Robert McNamara and others on trial for uh, the civilian bombing of Tokyo and the dropping of the atomic bomb and so on. Of course, if Japan had won the war, it might never have gotten to the atomic bomb stage, but there still was tremendous amount of firebombing of Japanese cities even before the atomic bomb. And, of course, uh, there was that kind of thing happened on both sides. It's just that when the war is over, the only war criminals are on the side of the losers. Uh, on the German side, uh, I'd have to give that a little bit more thought, but if Hitler had survived, of course, he would have said, you know, that his victory proved how right his government was and, and how right his policies were and so on, just as people a few a month ago were celebrating Saddam Hussein's capture as proof positive that George Bush had been right all along, yeah. although I never did figure out what the connection was between the two things. Well, I think what we could assume from both of these is that whoever wins, whoever prevails in any story, they're the ones that write the history. Of course. And it's, it's never objective. No. There is no such thing as an objective history. Well, there will be. I'm going to. I'm writing one now. <laughs> but but you're absolutely right, and there's no question about that because we don't have, as individuals, we don't have access to all the information. We rely on the press, and the press relies on the government. And so the government produces what is in its favor during the war. And when the war is over, the historians go to work to try to find what they can. And of course, just like in political battles, the historians go in with us already wedded to one side or the other. Maybe because of the political party of the president who ran the war, or maybe because of some other philosophical position of the historians. So some of them go in to defend it, others go in to debunk it, and we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at what they say. And if you read my book, uh, when it comes out later this year, The War Racket, you'll have to take with a grain of salt uh, some of the things, because you know that I have been opposed to the war in Iraq, I've been opposed to the way the war on terrorism has been done, and I've spoken very, very harshly about what our previous presidents have done in Vietnam, Korea, Second World War, and the First World War, and the Spanish-American War, and uh, the War of the Roses, and uh, the war against Sodom and Gomorrah, and on and on and on and on and on. So you have to take my bias into consideration also. You're, you're, but you're absolutely right. You're going to write an objective history. It reminds me of the joke about the little girl who's drawing a picture, and her mother says, what are you drawing? And she says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the mother says, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl says, well, he will in just a few minutes. When I finish. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Chuck. Let's go now to Florida and talk with David. Good evening, David. Are you with us? Yes. Oh, well, good. Harry, I met you in West Palm Beach several years ago, I think back in 2000. I've been a libertarian. The reason I'm calling is to express some frustration. I, I do my best to try to convert people to the libertarian philosophy, and many of them are in agreement with it. But one of the problems is, is that most people have no idea, for example, they don't realize that the income tax, the federal income tax, they think it's always been there. They don't realize it was tried several times and failed, and finally in 1913 they had to pass an amendment. Mm -hmm. The war on drugs, you know, it's horrible. America's longest losing war. They, they, they know drugs have been around for thousands of years, but they think they've always been illegal. They don't realize that drug prohibition is a recent invention. Oh, yes. And, for example, I, I'm a clinical psychologist by prof profession, and I try to tell people, just because people do stupid, unhealthy things, you don't make it illegal. My, my question is, and my suggestion is, how, as a libertarian, can you or I get across the message that the war on drugs, drug prohibition, is basically a price support system for drug dealers? And either you support the drug dealers by keeping drug prohibition in, or you oppose it. And they don't, they don't realize that when during alcohol prohibition, marijuana was legal. They're, they're shocked at that. And then it opens their eyes and they say, well, gee, how can I learn more about that? And I direct them to your website, to the Cato Institute website, to LP.org. And that's how I've been trying to get folks into libertarianism. Well, that's good. And I, I just have a few suggestions, uh, but you seem to be doing all right as it is. But uh, for you and anybody else who's interested, number one, don't feel that you have to make a complete conversion of anybody. Anything that you do to open somebody's eyes is going to help. And that means that if you have just simply, in this particular case, opened somebody's eyes to the fact that drugs haven't always been prohibited and that we didn't have all the problems with drugs that we seem to have today during the days when drugs were legal, then maybe there's something more to this and that person may begin asking you questions. But just be happy for every little victory because it's a step forward. Secondly, always treat the individual as though he is on your side and you are on his side. You're not at odds. Neither one of you wants a society in which everybody is high on heroin, and neither one of you wants a society in which drive-by shootings are taking place all the time and gangs are running the inner cities financed by drugs. Uh, neither one of you wants a society in which the Bill of Rights is torn up in a futile effort to try to end uh, drug use in America. So you, you really are not at odds whatsoever, and what that really says is to just simply relax when you're talking to somebody. Don't, don't feel any pressure pressure about this. It's not as though this is the way you, way you make your living, and if you don't make this sale right now, you're not going to be able to pay the rent this oh, month. I, I agree, and I thank you. My, another concern is that this guy, John Kerry, I'm, I mean, he may get to be president. He's a 
crazy drug warrior from what I read and hear. He's a crazy <laughs> I mean, I mean, he, no, he was, he was, he's, he was involved in America's second losing war, longest losing war, the war in Vietnam. They make a big deal about that. And he's also involved in America's longest losing war, the drug war. And I don't really know much about it, but it's really scary. Well, it's very, very interesting that now he's holding up his credentials as a military man, that he's had military experience, unlike Howard Dean and the others, and that puts him in a very a good position to be able to deal with terrorism and to deal with such questions as Iraq and so forth. And nobody is mentioning that it was only about a year or two ago that it came out that Kerry led a unit of men in Vietnam that slaughtered a bunch of civilians by mistake in a village in Vietnam. And the guy apologized and went over to Vietnam and apologized to the town and every, everything else. And now, just one year later, he's being held up as a, a guy with great military experience. Well, he really does have great military experience. He's right at home in the world that George Bush is creating. Awesome. So, any, anyway. Well, anyhow, uh, you're a breath, breath of fresh air. <laughs> I, as I said, I wish there were a lot more Harry Browns. And one other thing, I, I want to get your book on fail-safe investing. Is there some way to buy it in a hard copy or a paperback rather than just downloading it? Well, the best thing to do is to go to Amazon and just enter it, and there will be a page for it And if you just do a search in Amazon. And Amazon usually has access to it through book, uh, used book dealers, and you can buy it directly from Amazon, and they'll get one to you, and, and you can just uh, look at whatever is available, and they'll, they'll okay. usually be one that's very good condition. And if that doesn't work, try the same thing at the Barnes & Noble website. And I haven't looked at it in some time, so I can't tell you what the your, availability your, has been lately. Is your philosophy or portfolio recommendation similar to the permanent portfolio fund of which you're an advisor, I believe? Yes, I, I helped uh, Terry Cox and create that fund back in 1982, I believe it was. Do you own any shares of that fund? I feel that if you can set up the portfolio yourself, then you're always better off than working through an intermediary, but there are many situations in which it is useful to use the intermediary, such as if you have too small of a portfolio to be able to diversify properly yourself, or that you need a place where you can make constant deposits or withdrawals without having to rearrange the portfolio and so forth. So it's a question of personal taste as to whether or not to use the fund, but I am very much in favor of the fund, and if I weren't, I would not be a consultant to the fund. Because I use mutual funds in my retirement accounts. I'd like, I'd like to stick with mutual funds if possible. Sure. So that permanent portfolio does follow your recommendations. The fund has a permanent fixed set of investments, right. just as I do in the portfolio that I recommend. If you get fail-safe investing, in the back of the book, there is a help section of where you can get the investments that actually carry out the strategy that's in the book. If you read the book, then send me an email, and I will send you an updated list of those sources of the investments, because it's even simpler now than it was when I wrote that book a few years ago. This offer is good for anybody who happens to read fail-safe investing. Or if you download it from libertyfree.com, then it already has the updated recommendations. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. God bless you. Thank you, David. I appreciate your call. Bye. Andrew in Texas, are you still with us? Absolutely, Harry. How are you doing? I'm just fine. What's up? I just want to say that if I, if, I, if I was a member of the Great Unwashed and I listened to uh, Neil Bortz, I might think that, uh, that the support of the war in Iraq uh, and George Bush might be a necessity. Well, I, I know what you're saying, and if I may interject here, we've had several callers bring up the fact over the last few weeks that Neil Bortz is speaking at the Libertarian National Convention in May, and because he is a war hawk, a lot of libertarians are very upset about it. I talked last week with somebody who's on the Libertarian National Committee who assured me that Bortz is speaking on the subject of eminent domain, and that that has been clarified and understood with Bortz, that that is his subject, and he's happy to be speaking on it. And I can't swear that nothing will change between now and May, but if that is the case, I don't see any reason for libertarians to waste their time trying to object to his uh, appearance at the National Convention. I, I know what you're saying is that it's still an unfortunate thing that he's coming to so many people from Atlanta on the radio and telling them he's a libertarian and then praising George Bush and saying that Bush is doing exactly the right things in the war on terrorism. Exactly, yeah. Hey, listen, I just want to uh, chime in briefly, and I uh, really want to thank you for your program, and uh, you yourself, you keep up the outstanding work, Eric. Well, thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. Call any time. Let me give you a quick email that I still have here. Johnny in Oklahoma says, I wonder if you've seen the notice on the counters and post offices that beginning this past November, they're randomly opening one-third of all media mail. That's a specific mail classification for inspection. It certainly makes me feel secure that they're watching out for me. I've already received several pieces of junk mail with resealed tape or unsealed envelopes. Occasionally, I wonder if receiving libertarian literature will bring me any unwanted attention. Well, I can't answer that question, but you're pointing out just one more place for us to be concerned. Let's take our final call. Ron in Tennessee, are you still with us? Uh, yes, I am. I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long. Can you give us something about one minute? Uh, yes, I, I was curious uh, uh, about what you thought about the, the future prospects of uh, uh, the government forcing people to liquidate their 401ks at 70 and a half. Well, those laws change continually, and I really don't have any strong opinion about which way they're likely to go in the near future. Uh, so I, I don't really think I can offer anything of any substance that would be of any use to you. Are you approaching 70 and a half? Oh, no. I was just I was warned about the, about the investment uh, ideas about the, uh, so many people at, at you know, a given interval uh, having to uh, forcing them, being forced to liquidate their, their 401ks and, and being out of the market and, and so forth. Well, uh, when they liquidate the 401k, they don't liquidate the investments necessarily, and even if they have to sell them uh, for some technical reason, 
and they can just buy them back again outside of a 401k, uh, but they might be buying different investments in because the 401k may have been limited to the company that they were working for. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't see it as creating any kind of investment havoc. Oh. I, I don't think that's a problem. Uh, Rod, we're just about out of time, and I'm sorry that oh. we got you right up at the end. Great show. Great thank, show. Thank you so much, Rod. And before we go, I would like to mention something. I believe that this brouhaha over the weapons of mass destruction and the fact that Bush has suddenly got egg on his face, it has a very important lesson for us. Of course, it's not the lesson that we shouldn't uh, take what they say as gospel and that we should always be skeptical of anything they say. No, what I'm talking about right now is that six months ago, George Bush seemed unstoppable. And today, suddenly, he's weakened tremendously. This past week, I saw on the comedy, sh- uh, on the, pardon me, on the Daily Show on the Comedy Central channel, and that's an excellent show, incidentally, very anti-politician, and John Stewart is a very funny guy. It's a fake news show is what it is. But they have real guests on there, and Richard Pearl, the former uh, head of the Defense Policy Board, was on there defending the Iraq War and all of this. And his argument was that even without the weapons of mass destruction, we have so set a precedent that Iran and Syria and the others are now going to fall in line because they don't want to have happen to them what happened to Iraq. But unfortunately, Stewart didn't point out what I think was the most important aspect of that, and that is that the people in Iraq and Syria now realize that Bush is not as powerful as he was six months ago, and if he decided he wanted to go to war against them, he wouldn't get the popular support that he got a year ago for going to war against Iraq. And what I'm trying to get at here is that things can turn around. That six months ago, we would not have expected that the Warhawks would be in the vulnerable position that they're in right now. You know, for most of my adult life, I lived with the Cold War and thought that it was going to last forever. And then one day in 1989, for some reason that I still don't understand today, the Hungarian government opened the gate at the borders and let the tourists from East Germany out into Austria so that East Germans could get out from behind the Iron Curtain by passing through Hungary into Austria. Four months later, the Berlin Wall came down, and a year or two after that, the Cold War was over and the Soviet Union was gone. And no one to this day has yet explained to me why the Hungarian government did that, and a year before it happened, I would have told you there's no earthly reason that they would do it. What I'm trying to tell you is that you should not give up hope. You never know what's just around the corner. And this adversary that seems to be so dominant can suddenly be weakened and suddenly become impotent. We don't know that George Bush is going to get reelected, and of course we don't know who's going to take his place if he isn't reelected, and how good or how bad that person may be, mostly how bad. But the point is that we should never give up hope because we don't know what is around the corner. And I hope you will give up nothing this week and be with me next Saturday night. This is Harry Brown. Thanks again for listening. Good night.